The Subcommittee for Indigenous Peoples of the United States will now come to order. The subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on H.R. 733 to ride for the transfer of certain federal land in the state of Minnesota for the benefit of the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. Uh, H.R. 1031 to take certain land located in San Diego County, California into trust for the benefit of the Pala Band of Mission Indians and for other purposes. H.R. 1803 to nullify the supplemental treaty between the United States of America and the Confederate Tribes and Bands of Indians of Middle Oregon. And H.R. 2961 to reaffirm that certain land has been taken into trust for the benefit of the Samish Indian Nation and for other purposes. Under Committee Rule 4F, any any oral opening statements at hearings are limited to the chairman and the ranking minority member or their designee. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted today by, to the clerk by 5 p.m. Hearing no objection, no objection, so ordered. Good morning to you all, and warm welcome to all of our witnesses here today. Today, we will be examining legislation that furthers our commitment to tribal sovereignty and self-determination. H.R. 733, introduced by Representative McCollum of Minnesota, directs the Department of Agriculture to transfer approximately 11,760 acres of federal land in the Chippewa National Forest to the Department of the Interior to be held in trust for the benefit of the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. The Leech Lake Band has the largest population of all the Minnesota tribes, yet the smallest amount of land available for its use. Much of the tribe's land was lost when many of its members were illegally dispossessed to their land via secretarial transfers during the 1950s. The return of this land through H.R. 733 will assist the tribe in rebuilding its land base, enable the protection of sacred sites, and allow the construction of housing on some of the tracks near the tribe's existing communities. H.R. 1031, introduced by Representative Vargas of California, will take approximately 700 acres located in the San Diego County, California, into trust for the benefit of the Pala Band of Mission, Mission Indians. The Pala Band is located in northern San Diego County on a reservation that is home to a majority of the, of the 918 enrolled members. The tribe recently completed the purchase of land on Gregory Mountain, as well as land in Gregory Canyon that includes sacred and culturally important sites. By taking the land to trust, the tribe will be able to protect and preserve the land and those sites for further generations. H.R. 1803, introduced by Representative Walden of Oregon, will nullify the Supplemental Treaty of 1865 between the United States and the Confederate Tribes and Bands of Indians of Middle Oregon. The Warm Springs Confederate Tribes signed a treaty with the United States in 1855 in which they relinquished millions of acres of their land but reserved the Warm Springs Reservation for their exclusive use as well as off-reservation fishing, hunting, and gathering. After the, treaty, after the treaty signing, the tribes maintained their accustomed practice of traveling regularly to the Columbia River to harvest salmon. However, non-Indian settlers in the area convinced the Oregon Superintendent of Indian Affairs to pursue efforts to keep the tribes away. As a result, in 1865, a small number of Warm Springs members were fraudulently made to sign a supplemental treaty that in practice stripped the tribes of off-reservation rights and prohibited their members from leaving the reservation without a written permit issued by the Indian agent. Both the Indians of the Warm Springs Reservation and the United States government recognized that this was deceptive action and have consistently ignored the 1865 agreement while also reaffirming the, the tribe's off-reservation treaty rights. Passage of H.R. 1803 will finally officially correct this historic injustice and nullify the 1865 tr uh, treaty. Lastly, H.R. 2961, introduced by Representative Larson of Washington, will reaffirm the November 2018 decision by the Department of Interior to take approximately 6.7 acres of land into trust for the benefit of the Samish Indian Nation of Washington. After regaining its federally recognized status in 1996, the Samish Nation has worked hard to restore its land base through the federal fee to trust process at the Department of Interior. However, the ability for the tribe to acquire land has been complicated by the U.S. Supreme Court's 2009 Carcheri decision. November 2018, the Department of the Interior, acting through the Bureau of Indian Affairs, finally approved Samish's application to take 6.7 acres of undeveloped land into trust on behalf of the tribe. The BIA reached its decision after completing a nine-year Kachari analysis in which they determined that the tribe fulfilled the criteria under the decision and is therefore eligible to have land taken into trust under the Indian Reorganization Act. Despite this favorable decision by the BIA, the tribe still faces Kachari challenges. The majority of this House and of both parties believe the Supreme Court was incorrect in its interpretation of the IRA in the Carcheri decision. We showed that recently by passing a clean fix on the House floor by an overwhelming majority. My hope is that the Carcheri fix can move quickly through the Senate and be enacted into law so that all tribes can once again be treated equally when it comes to trust land acquisition. Until that time, however, we must continue to pass standalone legislation like H.R. 2961. 
to ensure that tribes are not hampered by frivolous claims and lawsuits regarding their rightfully acquired lands. All these bills are important to the health and security of each tribe, and I look forward to passing them out of committee in the House and as soon as possible. I would, like now, I would, not, I would now like to recognize Mr. Curtis for an opening remark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you mentioned, the subcommittee will be receiving testimony today on four pieces of legislation. In the interest of time, and since you've already described each of the bills on the agenda, I will keep my remarks brief. I'd first like to point out that by holding a hearing today on H.R. 733, this committee is again moving a piece of legislation that is neither sponsored nor co-sponsored by the member whose district would be affected by the bill. Even more concerning, this is the second hearing today by this committee where I've seen this troubling trend. In addition, certain existing utility easements, rights of ways, and flowage and reservoir rights issues have not been resolved. I welcome the opportunity to work with the tribe and other affected entities to resolve any uncertainty. Turning to HR 2961, several tribes have continued to voice strong concerns to the committee over the implications the bill may have on their treaty rights. While there seems to be little concern with acquiring in trust a seven acre parcel of land identified in this bill, there's a great deal of concern with affirming a BIA record of decision because it contains a historical analysis relating to an Indian treaty. The tribes that are signatories or successors to this treaty strongly dispute the validity of BIA's analysis. Because the Shamish tribe nation is not a treaty tribe, I think this committee should exercise caution in proceeding with this legislation. It is also concerning that no members of the Washington delegation are co-sponsors. I want to offer my full support of H.R. 1803, sponsored by my good friend, Mr. Walden. I understand that this bill will clean up any uncertainty regarding two treaties signed by the Warm Springs tribes in the mid-1800s. I want to thank our witnesses for being here today and look forward to their testimony. I'd like to include two letters into the hearing record for the Tulalip tribe and the Lummi tribe on H.R. 2961. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield my time. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Curtis. Now I'd like to welcome our distinguished witnesses. Join us today to write testimony. We have Dr. Larry LeCount, Director of the Bureau of Indian Affairs at the U.S. Department of the Interior. Mr. Frank Bim, Acting Associate Deputy Chief of the Natural Forest System and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The Honorable Arthur LaRose, Secretary of the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. The Honorable Robert H. Smith, Chairman of the Pala Band of Mission Indians. Mr. Ron Supa, former Tribal Council Member of the Confederate Tribes of Warm Springs and the Honorable Tom Moon, Chairman of the Samish Indian Nation. And finally, the Honorable uh, Brian Kludutsby, Chairman of the Swinomish Indian Tribe, uh, Indian Tribal Community. Let me remind the witnesses that under our committee rules, they must limit their oral statements to five minutes, but that their entire statement will appear in the hearing record. When you begin, the lights on the witness table will turn green. After four minutes, the yellow, the, the yellow light will come on. Your time will have expired when the light, red light comes on, and I will ask you to please complete your statement. I will also allow the entire panel to testify before members begin questioning the witnesses. The chair now recognizes Mr. Darrell LeCount. Good afternoon, Chairman Gallego uh, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Darrell LeCount. I am the director of the Bureau of Indian Affairs at the Department of the Interior. Thank you for the opportunity to present this statement on behalf of the department regarding the following bills. H.R. 733, H.R. 1031, H.R. 1803, and H.R. 2961, that you so eloquently described. H.R. 733 directs the Secretary of the Agriculture to transfer certain lands in the Chippewa National Forest to the Secretary of the Interior to be held in trust for the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwa in Minnesota. H.R. 733 also includes several prohibitions. Number one, that any federal law relating to the export of unprocessed logs harvested from federal land shall apply to any such logs harvested from the lands defined in H.R. 733. That the land defined in H.R. 733 shall not be eligible or used for any gaming activity carried out under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. And that any commercial forestry activity out carried out on the land shall be managed in accordance with applicable federal law. H.R. 1031, the Palo Band of Mission Indians Land Transfer Act of 2019, takes approximately 700 acres of land located in San Diego County, California, into trust for the benefit of the Palo Band of Mission Indians. The land at issue is sacred and contiguous to the Palo Band of Mission Indians Reservation and will be managed in its natural state. No development or other use of this property is considered. 
H.R. 1031 also prohibits gaming activities to be conducted on the land taken into trust for the tribe, either as a matter of claimed inherent authority or under any federal law, including the Indian Gaming Regulatory <coughs> Act. Administering lands, trust lands is an important responsibility that the United States undertakes on behalf of Indian tribes. The Congress can direct the Department to accept and administer lands to be held in trust. Thus, the Department does not take issue with Congress's decision to pursue this legislation proposals of H.R. 733 and H.R. 1031 for this purpose. H.R. 1803 nullifies the supplemental treaty between the United States and the Confederated Tribes and Bands of Indians of Middle Oregon concluded on November 15, 1865. The Confederated Tribes and Bands of Middle Oregon today, and known as the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs Reservation, signed a treaty on June 25, 1855 ceding most of their aboriginal territory to the United States, which makes up most of what we now know as North Central Oregon. On November 15, 1865, the tribes were forced to sign the Supplemental Treaty, which further restricted the rights of tribal members to the extent that, among other things, they could not leave the reservation without written permission from the agency superintendent. These are unreasonable restrictions on the rights of the Warm Springs people. We are aware of no other tribe that is currently subject to such a restrictive treaty. The Supplemental Treaty has never been enforced by either the federal government or the state of Oregon. H.R. 1803 would provide that Supplemental Treaty shall have no force or effect. As such, the Department has no objection to this bill. H.R. 2961 reaffirms that certain land that has been taken into trust for the benefit of the Samish Na Indian Nation and for other purposes, specifically the Notice of Decision dated November 9, 2018, and the actions taken by the BIA Northwest Regional Director to approve the application of the Samish Indian Nation to take approximately 6.7 acres of land into trust are ratified and confirmed. As identified in the bill, the department has determined to take 6.7 acres of land into trust for the Samish Indian Nation. We believe the record established supports that decision. However, there are challenges to our decision pending before the Interior Board of Indian Appeals. H.R. 2961 will cut short all appeals to the notice of decision, a decision that can only be made by Congress. The Department neither supports nor opposes this bill. In conclusion, the Department looks forward to working with the subcommittee as you move forward. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I would be glad to answer any questions the subcommittee may have. Thank you for your testimony. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Frank Ben. Thank you, Chairman Gallego, and the members of the subcommittee for inviting me to share the views of the Department of Agriculture on the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe Reservation Restoration Act. The department has some concerns with the bill. However, we understand the issues that led to this legislation and are committed to working with the Leech Lake Band and the subcommittee to find solutions. We take our responsibility to the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe very seriously. The historical and legal relationship between the band and the Chippewa National Forest is unlike any other federal tribal relationship within the National Forest System. The forest was created by statute in the early 20th century out of land set aside to serve as a treaty guaranteed reservation for the band. Today, about 90% of the reservation is found within the boundary of the forest, and about 45% of the forest is within the reservation. In 2016, we began working with the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe on issues specific to the Chippewa National Forest, we have worked together to address those issues for the benefit of Ojibwe lifeways and the general public. The Forest Service and the Leech Lake Band have engaged in a series of consultations to work through the band's specific management priorities. Darla Lenz, Forest Supervisor of the Chippewa National Forest, and others have a productive working relationship with the band. Just last month, the Chippewa National Forest hosted a national civil culture workshop, and Leech Lake Elder Mr. Mike Smith provided opening comments. Turning to the legislation, the Forest Service and the Leech Lake Band officials have met several times to discuss the issue of land transfer and review the list of proposed parcels. An initial review of the land parcels was completed, and some parcels are no longer owned by the Forest Service. In the course of that review, we further identified administrative issues we want to make sure that we can work through. These include fragmented ownership patterns and boundaries. We would also need to address changes in access and recreational opportunities that may occur in some areas of the forest, as well as resolve ongoing activities including timber sale contracts and special use permits that include rights of ways, utilities, railroads, and cemeteries. The USDA Forest Service is committed to supporting and respecting the sovereignty of tribal governments, as well as supporting our rural communities. We look forward to continuing to work with the subcommittee and the band to ensure the prosperity of the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe 
and provide benefits and services from the Chippewa National Forest in a way that engages our public and the band to offer solutions that can work for all. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Bim. The chair now recognizes the Honorable Arthur LaRose. The Honorable Chairman Ruben Gallego, <clears throat> Ranking Member Paul Cook, and members of the committee, Buju and greetings. My name is Arthur LaRose. I am proud to serve as Secretary Treasurer of the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. Thank you for providing me with the opportunity to testify before you today and for taking the time to review H.R. 733, the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe Reservation Restoration Act. Congress McCullum, Con Congresswoman McCollum, I want to thank you for introducing the important legislation and working closely with the committee to advance it. We deeply appreciate your unwavering commitment to Indian country and we thank you for many years of leadership and service to our community. The Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe is comprised of over 9,500 band members located in North Central Minnesota and is part of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe. Our band holds the smallest land percentage of the reservation out of 11 tribes in Minnesota. The passage of this led legislation will, will go a long way to restore over our limited land base while preserving the land for future generations. Of the 864,158 original acres, nearly 300,000 acres are surface area of three big lakes in our region. Further, the Chippewa National Forest holds over 75% of the land within the boundaries of the reservation, which leaves less than 5% owned by Leech Lake Band. Currently, the band's main federal priority is successful passage of this legislation, which would transfer 11,760 acres of Chippewa National Forest back to the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. Starting in the year 1948, the Bureau of Indian Affairs incorrectly interpreted a Department of Interior executive order and believed that they had the authority to sell these individual tribal allotments without the consent of the rightful owners. This land was taken from our tribal allotments through a process called secretarial transfers. These sales eased in 1959 following a memo the Bureau of Indian Affairs received from the United States field solicitor that advised them that these sales are illegal. Of the 17,000 acres of tribal lands that were taken through this process, the biggest share, 11,760 acres, is located in Cass County. The Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe has no immediate intention to changing the use of these lands, we would honor current agreements and anticipate that these lands would be held until we develop a broader plan that will allow for a gradual subdivision for economic and residential development. The land will continue to be open to the public for hunting, fishing, and other recreation. We believe a significant tribal land base is the foundation of tribal sovereignty and determination, self-determination. Federally recognized lands from Geographical limits of each tribe's jurisdiction supports our residing tribal populations, is the basis of our tribal economy, and provides an irreplaceable form for our cultural usage, practices, and traditions. Within the Leech Lake community, the, the lack of land has a direct impact on our members' ability to access adequate housing. This has pro been proven to jeopardize the health and safety of our tribal members and as you know, the lack of housing remains a serious concern for not only Leech Lake, but for many tribes across the country. The passage of this legislation that would return 11,760 acres of land that was illegally taken from our band over 70 years ago is critical to in increase housing op options and will positively impact band members of our tribe now and for generations to come. We came very close to passing this legislation last Congress, and I urge the committee to swiftly pass this legisla legislation in the House and Senate so this bill can be signed into law. As you know, as you have heard, the legislation would restore the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe's limited land base, 
while at the same time honor current agreements and preserve the ban for future generations. On behalf of Leech Lake Chimigwich for the invitation to testify today, we know there are many important matters which come before this committee and are honored that you would take the time to review the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe Reservation Restoration Act. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ranking Member. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the Honorable Robert H. Smith. Good afternoon, Chairman Gallego and honorable members of the committee. Again, my name is Robert Smith, Chairman of the Paula Band of Mission Indians, located in northern San Diego County. I've been Chairman of the Paula Band since 1990. I'm proud to have represented the Capeno Seno people of Paula for these many years. It's an honor to sit here before you today on behalf of the people and ask for your support on House Resolution 1031, sponsored by Representative Juan Vargas and co-sponsored by one of your committee members, Representative Paul Cook. For nearly 30 years since before I became Paula's chairman, we fought to stop a proposed landfill from being built in Gregory Canyon, immediately adjacent to the Paula Reservation. The landfill would cover the slopes of one of our sacred mountains with garbage. The mountain Chakla is the home of the, one of the first people, the spirit Takwish, to prevent this desecration. Paula ended up having to buy the approximately 70 acres of land in 2016. It was a great victory, not just for Paula, but the Indian people throughout Southern California who honored Takwish and his many homes. Because this land is so important to us, we want to bring it to trust as part of the Paula Reservation. It is part of the Luceno traditional landscape and the land that has been occupied Native people since time immemorial. The property is contiguous to the Paula Indian Reservation and in addition to being one of the Takwish's sacred homes, it's also a site of ancestral village rock art paintings, artifacts, as well as culturally important plants and animals. While Paula has taken preliminary steps towards pursuing the feed of trust process to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the process that can take several years, which is why we asked Congressman Vargas to assist us through the legislative process to sooner our sacred lands into trust, the sooner we can protect it and preserve it. Paula has no desire or intention to develop the land in any way. Paula has successful gaming operations already, so there's no need for more land for this purpose. And even if there were, the property is very steep and rugged. It is undevelopable. Uh, the more important already stated is it's sacred to us. We will manage the land in its natural state and provide traditionally stewardship. The sacred landscapes that the Indian people have always maintained Putting the land into trust, making it part of the Paula Reservation will allow us to provide protection to the sacred chocolate deserves. Passing this bill is a more efficient and reasonable way to achieve this result. We're asking a very simple, the land needs to be protected, the federal trust status provides, and ask for your support in this bill and Paula's responsibility to protect sacred landscapes. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, for your testimony. And I'd like to recognize the Honorable Tom Wooten. Oops, sorry, I apologize. Made a little skip here. Oh, there we are. I'd like to now recognize Mr. Ron Supa. Afternoon, Chairman, many members. Uh, I am personally honored to be here asking you to correct a historic wrong perpetuated against the Warm Springs people. H.R. 1803, sponsored by Congressman Greg Walden and supported by the entire Oregon congressional delegation, would nullify a fraudulent treaty that sought to deprive my tribe of rights it reserved in its original treaty with the United States. In 1855, a treaty was negotiated and signed between my ancestors and the federal government. Under that original treaty, the Warm Springs and Wasco tribes relinquished approximately 10 million acres of land but reserved the Warm Springs Reservation for their exclusive use. In the treaty, the tribes retained their rights to harvest fish, game, and other foods off the reservation at all the places they had gone since to since time immemorial. After 1855, the tribes maintained their traditional practice of traveling regularly to the Columbia River to harvest salmon. 
The continued Indian presence at their usual and custom fishing sites, however, irritated the non-Indian settlers. This prompted then Superintendent of Indian Affairs for Oregon, J.W. Parrott Huntington, to keep the tribes away from the settlers. In 1865, Hunting Huntington drew up a, a supplemental treaty and convinced a handful of tribal members to sign it. According to its terms, the treaty prohibits the Indians from leaving the Warm Springs Reservation without written permission of the government. The 1865 treaty also relinquished all of the off-reservation rights so carefully negotiated by the tribes 10 years earlier. Yet the historical record proves the Indians of the Warm Springs Reservation did not comply with the 1865 treaty and did not understand its provisions. In fact, the government records from that era show that Warm Springs people understood the latter treaty as merely providing a pass system for Indians, distinguishing them from hostile Indians for their own protection. The next Indian agent for the government wrote to the Washington, D.C. and reported that the 1865 treaty was not properly interpreted to the Indians and that they were led to believe that their rights to take fish and hunt off reservation was protected in this second treaty supplement. In 1884, the Warm Springs agent wrote that the supplemental treaty was, quote, beyond a doubt, a forgery, and that the Warm Springs people were, I quote, willfully and wickedly deceived by the government. In 1886, another federal Warm Springs agent described the 1865 treaty this way, quote, if ever a fraud was villainously perpetuated on any set of people, red or white, this was one of the most glaring, end of quote, In 1887, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs reported to the Secretary of Interior that the Warm Springs people were, quote, cheated and swindled out of their right to fish by a cutting and unprincipled U.S. official, end quote. These are the words of representatives of the American government assessing the fraud perpetuated upon the Warm Springs Indians. My tribe has never recognized it, and the federal government has never sought to enforce it. Yet, as I testify here today, the 1865 treaty remains on the books. The right to hunt and fish in our ancestral areas are still exercised by the Warm Springs people. I personally fish from wood scaffolds at places like Shears Bridge on the Deschutes River and also on the Columbia River near the city of the Dells, not far from where the original 1855 treaty was negotiated. Because the 1865 treaty has never been enforced, its nullification will have no impact on the state of Oregon's rights or that of its citizens. The bill simply allows the Warm Street tribes to continue to exercise their 1855 <coughs> off-reservation rights without future fear of litigation or extortion extortion, as the late Senator Mark Hatfield said on the floor in 1996, this legislation will help the honor of the United States and the dig dignity of a long, wrong people. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Mr. Supa. I now would like to recognize the Honorable Tom Mooton. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, my name is Tom Wooten. I'm the chairman of the Samish Indian Nation located in the San Juan Islands. Accompanying me today is council member Jenna Burnett. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify. We also give thanks to Congressman Larson for introducing HR 2961 and for his support over the years. I'd like to share with you a few numbers, 50, 27, 10, and nine. It was 50 years ago in 1969 that the BIA made a clerical error and left our tribe off the list of federally recognized tribes. It took 27 years of, a, of the administrative process and litigation for the tribe to become re-recognized by the BIA in 1996. 
It took 10 years before the BIA placed our existing 79 acres of land into trust. This occurred before the 2009 Cartieri decision. It took nine years for the BIA to complete its Cartieri analysis for the tribe. Last November, the BIA issued a decision to take our Campbell Lake South property, which is 6.7 acres, into trust. The city of Anacortes and the Skagit County support these efforts, and we appreciate the relationship that we have with them. Uh, please take a look at the first slide. Looking at the map, our existing trust land and our new trust land are located on Fidalgo Island. Our existing trust land is shaded in red, and our new trust land is shaded in yellow. The properties are contiguous. The next slide here is the picture of our existing trust land and our new trust land property. The tree with the sign is the dividing line between the two parcels. Last November, the BIA issued a comprehensive 32-page analysis determining that the tribe met the criteria under the Carcieri decision. In its analysis, the BIA discussed at length the long-standing relationship between the United States and the tribe. Unfortunately, this is not the end of the story. Our neighbors, the Swinomish Indian tribal community, appealed the BIA's decision, claiming that the BIA does not have the authority to take land into trust for Samish due to the Carcieri decision. Due to this litigation, the department has frozen all the tribe's trust applications and halted our ability to provide for our people. Some of our other pending ap trust applications that have been placed on hold include our longhouse, which uh, houses our Head Start and Elder Services, and our Tribal Administration Complex. The bill would simply reaffirm the department's decision to take 6.7 acres of non-gaming land into trust that is contiguous to our existing trust land. And this, pattern after, this is patterned after the 2014 Gun Lake Act and other recently passed reaffirmation bills. Swinomish has opposed every land bill that Samish has ever uh, brought in the past decade, arguing that Samish should go through the administrative process instead of the uh, legislative fix. Now that Samish has been successful, Swinomish has sued the department Swinomish's appeal challenges the BIA's authority to take land into trust for Samish under Carcieri. The House just passed a Carcieri fix legislation, H.R. 375. Had this bill already been enacted by Congress, Swinomish's meritless lawsuit challenging the Carcieri determination would have been rendered moot already. Swinomish raises their treaty rights again, as they always do, to muddy the waters. Federal appellate courts for the last 27 years have ruled four times that Samish federal recognition and services include putting land into trust has nothing to do with treaty rights. Swinomish has been a party to all of these cases, but they refuse to accept the law. After 50 years, enough is enough. We've spent decades working to restore our land base for our community. We do this while everything that we can do to protect our history and traditional way of life. We should be able to have land taken into trust just like other federally recognized tribes. This bill would help that. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Wooten. The chair now recognizes the Honorable Brian Kladusby. Sorry if I, if I That's fine. said that. Not the first one, won't be the last. Good afternoon, good afternoon, Chairman Gallego, Ranking Member Curtis, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Kel Kaltzut, Brian Cladisby. My great-great-grandfather carried the same name, Kel Kaltzut, and signed the Treaty of Point Elliot with the United States in 1855. I am in the 23rd year as Chairman of the Swinomish Indian Tribal Community. We are a treaty tribe located in Northwest Washington State made up of the Aboriginal Swinomish, Samish, Lower Skagit, and Kikialis tribes. I'm here to express the Swinomish tribe's strong opposition to H.R. 2961, the self-styled Samish Indian Nation Land Reaffirmation Act. I say self-styled because the title of this bill would make it sound like a non-controversial legislative proposal. Unfortunately, this bill has very little to do with reaffirming a 6.7-acre trust acquisition by the Department of the Interior for an Indian tribe. Instead, H.R. 2961 would ratify and confirm a non-final November 9, 2018 decision by the BIA Northwest Regional Director. 
The Swinomish tribe is currently appealing this decision. This decision was signed not by the Secretary of the Interior or by the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs, but rather a subordinate agency official. The Swinomish tribe is appealing the decision because it reverses 40 years of federal court precedent and the long-standing litigation position of the United States. For more than two generations, the United States has taken the position that the Samish Indian Nation is not a successor to the parties to the 1855 Treaty of Point Elliot. Every federal court that has considered this question has agreed. Since Congressman Larson introduced H.R. 2961 less than two weeks ago, we have been in contact with the Lummi Nation, the Upper Skagit Tribe, and the Tulalip Tribes. We understand that those tribes also oppose the bill for similar reasons. If an enacted into law is introduced, this bill would ratify and confirm the regional director's decision with regard to all claims pending on the date of enactment or filed on or after that date. It would transform every sentence and every footnote of that 32-page single-spaced decision into federal law. This result would terminate our ongoing administrative appeal, divest the Interior Board of Indian Appeals of its jurisdiction to make a final decision for the department, and preclude the tribe from seeking judicial review if it receives an adverse decision from the board. We are not aware of any other instance in recent memory where this committee advanced legislation that would cut off at the knees an Indian tribe's right to utilize the department's longstanding appeal procedures to challenge an unlawful decision when treaty rights are at stake. Your trust responsibility to act in the best interest of the Swinomish tribe does not allow this result. Before I discuss the regional director's decision, I would like to point out that as a practical matter, the Samish Indian Nation currently owns the 6.7 acres of land at issue. Samish has stated that it does not intend to change the current use of the land if it is acquired in trust. As a result, any delay that results from allowing the administrative process to proceed will not prevent the Samish Indian Nation from continuing its preferred use of the land. For this reason, there is no practical need for this bill. The regional director's decision is fundamentally flawed because it relies on a false pr premise. The decision relies on the existence of the Treaty of Point Elliot to establish that the Samish Indian Nation was under federal jurisdiction in 1934. In fact, the regional director's determination cites no other legal basis under which any federal official could consider the Samish Indian Nation to have been under federal jurisdiction. Over the past 40 years at the urging of the United States, federal courts have held repeatedly and consistently that the Samish Indian Nation is not a successor to any tribe that participated in the Treaty of Point Elliot. My written testimony summarizes the cases that have rejected the Samish Indian Nation's prior attempts to claim successorship to the parties to the treaty. The regional director's decision attempts to draw a distinction between treaty rights and statutory benefits, such as acquiring lands and trust. However, while the fact that the Samish Indian Nation is not a successor to a treaty tribe did not preclude it from obtaining federal recognition as a tribe, it does not preclude it from obtaining any benefits based on a claim of treaty successor status. Every court that has considered the evidence has concluded that the Samish Indian Nation can claim no rights or benefits under the treaty because it is not a successor to any treaty party. By ratifying and confirming the regional director's decision, this bill would undermine 40 years of precedence and the extensive litigation litigating position of the United States on this very point. This bill opens the door for the Samish Indian Nation to seek treaty hunting and gathering rights to the detriment of the Swinomish tribe and at least three other tribes in our area. Chairman Gallego, you and Chairman Grijalva have often mentioned the United States trust responsibility. I can think of no greater violence to that concept than allowing a bill to move forward that cuts off an Indian tribe's right to challenge a non-final agency decision that will adversely affect its treaty rights and the rights of other tribes and instead codifies that decision into federal law. I remind each of you that you are the trustees of the Swinomish tribe and all our members. To be very clear, we object to this bill. This bill will upend 40 years of federal law that Swinomish and other area tribes have relied on in managing our treaty resources. In conclusion, it would be a breach of this committee's trust responsibility to my tribe, the Lummi tribe, the Upper Skagit tribe, and the Tulalip tribe to allow this bill to move forward in its current form. This concludes my statement, and at this time I'd be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you for that valuable testimony. The chair will now recognize members for questions and under committee rule 3D, each member will be recognized for five minutes. I'll begin by recognizing the ranking member, uh, Mr. Curtis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for accommodating. Uh, thank you again to all of our guests. Uh, Mr. Wooten, the controversy with HR 21, 2961 is the bill's reaffirmation of the BIA record of decision, whose rationale is based on an interpretation of the treaty 
of Point Elliot that is sharply disputed by the tribes who are signatures to the treaty. Since no one seems to object to the Shamish having the 6.7 acre parcel placed in trust, do you think it makes sense to amend the bill to eliminate the affirmation of the disputed BIA record of decision and to declare simply that the land is held in trust? Thank you for the question. Um, no, I, I believe that the record stands for itself. It took nine years for the Bureau to go through the extensive record that the tribe has through the litigation of 27 years. And I have to disagree with Chairman Cladisby that we are uh, connected to the historic tribe, whether he wants to believe it or not. And there are court cases that uh, demonstrate that as well. Your testimony states that the Shamish has followed the administrative process and that the BIA regional director has issued a decision in your favor, but the bill would terminate Shamish's pending appeal, which is also part of the administration process. Had the BIA regional director denied your application, how would you feel about a bill that ratified that decision and cut off your ability to challenge it? Well, it's been that way for almost 50 years for us. We have uh, litigated this issue um, the treaty rights issues aren't really part of this. We don't believe it's part of the uh, discussion. But yes, it's, it's been an ongoing struggle for us. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, I'm going to try this. Mr. Kladuspi, uh, would you continue? Did we got it? I think we nailed it. it. Good. Well, you good. should ask him. <laughs> did we do all right? Okay, would you continue? You did good. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Would you continue to oppose H.R. 2916 if it was amended to eliminate the reaffirmation of or any reference to the BI record of decision made by the Northwest Regional Director? Could you repeat that again, please? Okay. Would you continue to oppose 2916 if it was amended to eliminate the reaffirmation of or any reference to the BIA record of decision made by the Northwest Regional Director? And uh, once again, uh, Mr. Curtis, this isn't the first time uh, we've been here. Rick Larson, Congressman Larson, my congressman, has been introducing Samish uh, land bills for the last six, eight years. And uh, uh, a year and a half ago, uh, we tried to amend his legislation. We went over to the Samish Indian Nation's uh, homeland there to uh, uh, have a meeting with them uh, to look at amending that bill. Uh, we suggested uh, edits to that bill that would take out any reference to treaty rights, and they denied that. Uh, when they got recognized in 1996, uh, I believe, this is my personal feeling, that one of their fatal flaws, that they uh, told the courts this was not about treaty rights. We, we're not interested in our treaty rights and our hunting and our gathering, and uh, here we are 20-some years later with a decision by the BIA that critically impacts that treaty right decision. So. You know, taking that out would be a big step forward, but I don't know if Samish would agree, uh, as you heard um, the chairman say, I, you know, we would sit down and look at amending this uh, and sitting with them at the table and talking about it, but I think you heard uh, they wouldn't want to do anything other than what it states in its current form, and we have a serious problem with that. I, I understand. Uh, thank you both. I, I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member. Now you'll time uh, to my so task the first question. Uh, the question goes to Chairman Wooden. Your neighboring tribe is here today testifying against H.R. 2961. Could you please discuss what Samish has done in the past to try and work with the, the Swinomish community to reach a consensus? Again, you just heard from Chairman Gladys be uh, mentioned that we have had several meetings over the years. It's actually been 10 years that we've been trying to uh, continue to acquire land since the uh, Cartier uh, decision happened. Um, and it's, it, we're kind of at loggerheads over this treaty rights issue, and um, we believe that the record is what the record is. Um, we have done extensive research on who the Samish people really are, and that's who we are. We're, we are tied to the historical tribe, and that's the way it is, yes. But we will, if we need to, we'll continue to, to work on it with our neighbors and 
you all and whoever else we can to, to move this forward because it is important that tribes have lands to uh, benefit their membership. Again, I don't believe that the Samish Indian nation should be treated any different than any other federally recognized tribe. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. LeCount, uh, thank you for being here and for your testimony on all the bills before us. My questions are in regard to H.R. 2961. Is considering treaty rights on the BIA land into trust checklist for fee to trust applications? In this particular instance, uh, you examine the parcel that's in front of you independent of anything else. You, you base the, the, the record and the facts on, on what's in front of you and, and, and not so much uh, what's around you. We, we do look at uh, uh, traditional uh, aboriginal lands, but, but oftentimes they overlap. And so there's not a clear distinction line to where you can say, you know, this was clearly you know, Crow, and this was clearly Cheyenne or something to that nature. Okay. Does that answer your question? It, it does. Let's go a little further. In, uh, uh, you recently testified, I don't know if I call it recent, about a year ago, uh, that the department, and you, you quote, the department agrees that certainty of title is important as it provides tribes, the United States, and the state and local governments with the clarity needed to carry out each sovereign's respective obligations. Such certainty is pivotal to the tribe's ability to provide essential government services to its citizens, such as housing, education, health care, and promote tribal economies. With that quote in mind, do you think the Samish deserve certainty with respect to its lands? I believe every tribe deserves certainty, yes. Thank you. Chairman uh, Clads Cladsby, God, I keep messing this up. You, <laughs> you have repeatedly called for Samish to go, quote, through the process in order to acquire any land to trust. In fact, the vice chairman of your tribe testified before this committee last Congress saying that, quote, for much of the past decade, the BIA, BIA's Northwest Regional Office evaluated and decided tribal applications for fee to trust acquisitions and that this process worked efficiently and without undue delay. He then stated, uh, quote, there is no reason why the Samish Indian Nation cannot do the same. It seems to me that the Samish did exactly as your vice chairman suggested. Wouldn't you say that the BIA and the DOI determination process would suffice as going through the process as your community has repeatedly urged? Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure if anyone on this committee has read that 32-page, single-spaced, line-by-line decision that the BIA made in Portland. It's got some pretty serious flaws from our concern. Now, when Samish put that 78 acres into trust about 20 years ago, I was at that meeting with the former chairman, uh, Ken Hansen, at the Fidelgo Middle School, and we had no problem with them reacquiring that land, uh, wanting to create a homeland. And once again, this, you know, going back to my tribe, I don't think the 6.7 acres would be a big deal to us. It's the 32-page single-space line things in there that we have a serious concern with. Successor for one, the courts have ruled that uh, the Swinomish and the Lummi tribes are successor to the Aboriginal Samish. The courts have ruled that the Nuwaha yeah. are successors to- Chairman, I'm running out of, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna ask you a couple sure. other questions. So, have you supported the Kacheri fix in the past? As the president of the National Congress of American Indians, I have testified in front of the Senate and the House in support of a clean right. car cherry fix, but as, as chairman of the Swinomish tribe, we have been neutral in our position on a clean so you do, car cherry fix. So you do not fix. support the current fix of H.R. 375? We don't oppose it or support it. We're not a car cherry tribe, even though Swinomish has really? land into trust issues right now. The Samish are challenging our fee to trust right now. And we have a 55-acre oyster bed that was just approved by the BIA that the Samish is opposing. So don't think for one instance that it's just Swinomish doing these opposings of Samish. Samish is on record of opposing us on our fee to trust. And I'd love to come to you to have you uh, write a bill for me to say we're going to take Swinomish's 55 That's, acres into trust. You're going over your time there, Mr. Chairman. But we will follow the process. But just to summarize, so you are not for the contrary fix. I did not say that. I said we don't oppose it or support it. Um, as president of NCAI, I was very vocal in supporting a clean car cherry okay. fix. That's all I need. Thank you. Moving on. Thank you. Recognize Representative Soto. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. You know, as I sit here today, as we so often do here and hear these injustices, secretarial land transfer is a fancy way of 
theft, calling theft of land by the federal government, uh, landfills being attempted to be located at sacred mountains, restricting fish, fishing rights and even movement with a fraudulent treaty, and then infighting. That's one of the reasons why we're on this committee, is to right these injustices and to try to meet out some of these disagreements as best we can with the original assumption and understanding that you all are tribal sovereigns. And the United States has and needs to get back to a posture of understanding truly what that means. So to the extent that you all traveled from across the United States to be here today, thank you for that. And we hope that through this committee and others, you'll get the justice uh, that you seek. Um, first, uh, to uh, Secretary LaRose, uh, thank you for your testimony. Can you briefly describe to us the resources the band uses uh, to manage the land in the Chippewa National Forest? Microphone, please. Excuse me. Yep. Just a second here. Uh, the Leech Lake Band of Ojoy currently manages 40,000 acres. That's what we have and we've had for many years now. Within the boundaries of our reservation, our DRM has over 40 staff members. Resource management, that's what that is. Uh, we focus on a range land management issues from wildlife, ecology, wildfire response, environmental regulation, and timber management. In addition, we do right-of-ways and easements. We ha we've had a timber management plan since 2002. We also so, manage. Oh, continue. Go ahead. So it's fair to say that the Leech Lake Division of Resource Management would be able to continue the job of water quality conservation and, and preserving cultural resources. Exactly, like okay. I said earlier, we've managed 40,000 acres of land for many, many years now after the Nelson Act and after this uh, secretarial transfers. You know, the, 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 the land we lost is significant and really uh, devastates our people as, as a whole. You know, 864,000 acres we once managed and now we we're down 40,000. So. Okay. Given my limited time, we're very supportive of it. I just wanted to make sure we establish that y'all have the resources to be able to do that, and that's uh, excellent to hear. Um, for uh, Chairman Wooten, it'd be great to get a sense of the Samus's historical connection to this land and area. And can we s briefly start before the 1855 treaty to, to give us an idea of the kind of connection there was there and afterwards? Because it seems like it's a existential issue of, of whether there was a connection or not. Yes, thank you, Mr. Soto. The, the Samish Indian Nation has existed for time and memorial and as traditional territory within the uh, San Juan Islands. It controlled the southern San Juan Islands, uh, which is Fidalgo Island, where the tribe currently resides, is, is one of those islands. It controlled Samish Island, Fidalgo Island, Guimas Island, Cypress Island, and Southern Lopez. And so where this land's located is on Fidalgo Island. And uh, uh, Chairman Cladisby, uh, is there a recognition that the Samish tribe should exist, or is that the real issue, whether you no, all No, not at all. The federal government has given the Samish tribe a federal recognition. What they didn't give them, though, uh, because it, that Samish's request was treaty rights. And that's uh, the big issue for us today, treaty rights, hunting and gathering rights. And uh, Chairman Wooten, what, what treaty rights do you all hope to exercise in addition to putting the land in trust? So again, thank you for the question. From Samish's perspective, this bill has nothing to do with treaty rights. Um, we don't plan on exercising any treaty rights on this land. This land was acquired to put a access road across the property to save some money on a BIA road that we want to construct on our existing trust land. Thank you, my time has expired. Thank you, Representative Soto, and I recognize uh, Representative Holland. 
Thank you very much, Chairman, and thank you all so much for being here this afternoon. I, um, I have a question for Chairman Smith. Uh, I understand that the sooner your sacred land is in trust, the sooner it can be protected and preserved by your people. Can you tell us why it's important that this be pursued through legislative process rather than through the BIA? Again, the, the sacredness of the site and the, our spiritual leader, that's where it came from. We have a lot of art, artifacts there. We do a lot of gatherings there to protect it. And if we go to the Feet of Trust process, it would take up to, you know, five to ten years. So again, just protecting a sacred site, that's the number one issue for our people. Thank you. Thank you. That, that is um, very explanatory. And my next question will be for Mr. Supa. Would the nullification of the 1865 Supplemental Treaty guarantee Warm Springs tribes any rights beyond the current off-reservation fishing, hunting, gathering, and grazing rights afforded to tribal members now? Uh, no, we would just um, continue to exercise the, right, the inherent rights and sovereignty um, as we negotiated in the 1855 treaty. There would be basically no effect upon uh, Oregon's or the citizens of uh, Oregon. I think that basically we, we'd like to maybe just have the treaty uh, off the books. Thank you very much, and thank you for your testimony. I, um, it's, it's, uh, sometimes there's no words to describe the underhandedness that, that the U.S. government inflicted on tribes. And, and I'm, I'm sorry that your people uh, were essentially swindled in this way. And I, I came to Congress because I feel, felt like Native Americans needed a voice. And I just want to assure you that, that I am here to, to be that voice. And um, I realize for uh, Chairman Cladisby and Chairman Wooten, uh, you're at odds over this issue. That's just that's the easiest way I guess I can put it. Um, and I, I care deeply about both of you and, and your people. I, I, I want um, nothing better than for us, for you, uh, to perhaps talk this out. It sounds like you've talked a lot, but maybe there's something that um, one of you can give a little more and, and the other one can give a little more, but... Um, in the end, of course, we know it's about your people. It's about the children. It's about future generations. It's about, about all of our people having a future in this country when we've had so much heartache in the past. It's time for us to, um, it's time for us to, to find some, some, I guess, some equal ground perhaps, to find an equal voice, to make sure that in the end that we're, we, the thing that really, really matters is our children and our grandchildren. And so um, I am going to read that 32 page. Um, I'll read extensively on this issue, which I have not done yet. And um, I hope that in the meantime, perhaps, you know, something can be done to agree. Um, you know, I come, I'm from Laguna Pueblo. We have six villages there, and none of us agree on anything, right? It's hard to even, like, we're all Lagunas, and in between our villages, you know, everybody has their own ideas and their own interpretations of things. So um, my hope is that we can all be one people moving forward and that we perhaps can help to, um, to you know, to be a support to the, to the both of you. And um, if you ever need me, you are more than welcome to call. And I, th I thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Representative Holland. 
I thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and members for their questions. The members of the committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses and we will ask you to respond to these in writing. Under committee rule 3.0, members of the committee must submit witness questions within three business days from the following hearing. And the hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for these responses. If there's no further business, without objection, the committee stands adjourned. Yeah, yeah, I'll go. Yeah, you have to. Right? Good job. Yeah, you too.